Alrighty, so let's go into the five P's of protective medicine. First is principle. The principle is the one you're protecting, your client. There may be more than one. And also you may have a main principle and they may have an entourage, they may have assistance. So uh, we just don't ignore whoever the principal is traveling with just because they're not the one that we're, we're actually there for primarily. Uh, so anything we say about the principal, um, we're going to apply that to anybody that they're traveling with as well. Uh, personnel, that's uh, part of your protection team, your drivers, anyone that's supporting the protective effort. Uh, your, and we want to talk about uh, what kind of gear the personnel should have on them, what kind of training they should have. Uh, pack, uh, everybody's going to have a, some sort of an admin pack with them. So uh, what should be in that pack as far as medical gear? We won't talk about the other stuff uh, today. Uh, platform, that's how you're getting from point A to point B. Are you in a vehicle? Are you in a van? Are you in an SUV? Are you in a helicopter? What are you What are you riding in? And place, anytime they're sick and injured, you need to have some place to take them to give them better medical care than you can treat on in the field. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, see what we can do breaking down each one of these. Uh, all right, for principle, our first P, we want to med map all the principles. What that means is getting at least a brief medical history. And uh, to do that, uh, the map stands for medications. So we want to know what medications they've, they're taking, what they have taken, uh, what they do take. Uh, allergies, uh, do they need an EpiPen? Uh, do they have, uh, does Benadryl work for them? Uh, what kind of allergies do they have? Is it severe? And what uh, do we need to have in our pack to mitigate that? And P is prior illness or prior medical history. Uh, what do they have? Do they have uh, diabetes, heart conditions? Um, you want to know what their prior, uh, previous problems are so that you can plan for um, something when you're on detail with them. Uh, if they have heart conditions, obviously you want to know what medications, which goes back to that first M, they're taking, uh, how they present, when they need it, how they need it. Do they have that? Do you need to procure it on the ground when you get into the uh, area you're going to be working with them? Um, anyways, uh, there's a, a whole class on that alone. So these are just medical considerations, but that's our med map. Uh, blood type, that's pretty obvious. Uh, if they lose blood, we want to put, put their blood type back into them and we can tell the hospitals or the trauma locations we're going to be uh, doing this, what their blood type is. Um, a lot of the blood type uh, work we did in the U.S. military we found later was incorrect. Uh, so getting blood typed is uh, an important thing if you're going to be in an area, especially a high-risk area. Uh, should the principal be carrying an individual first aid kit? That's what IFAC means. Uh, generally speaking, if we have a, a client that we work on a long-term basis uh, frequently, we will eventually have something on them. And the reason why that is is because we like to treat individuals, um, not just the principal, but our teammates as well, with the gear they have on them and not with our gear. Uh, our gear should be reserved for us if we get injured and uh, our, our principals uh, should have something on them that we can treat them with. If they're a one-off uh, detail, like I'm uh, going down to Bogota, Colombia, maybe working somebody for two days and then out. Yeah, I might not have one. I might might just give them something to throw into their pocket. It might not be a full IFAC, but uh, maybe some blood stopper gear. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little while. Uh, special considerations when dealing with medical stuff. Uh, right now, obviously, the big thing is COVID. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of... Uh, testing going in and out of countries now. You have to get tested to get out, have a, or show a test to get onto a plane, get into the country. You may be tested at the airport or you may just be uh, obligated to show them your uh, negative results within 72 hours. Um, crossing borders, same thing. You may have to get tested uh, or show them proof. So we have to plan all this out before we even get on the ground is how we're going to get all these, this testing done. Uh, additionally, uh, there are some medications that you can take before you get on the ground that will minimize the chances of you picking up COVID. And this is whether you're vaccinated or not. You can get COVID if you are vaccinated. It's just uh, going to minimize these symptoms usually, not always. Um, but you can take some medications to actually uh, mitigate that. Uh, we won't go into the medications in this presentation. This is a considerations presentation rather than a, uh, a medical class. Uh, now let's talk about personnel. Personnel, once again, are anybody that's on the protection team. Your security personnel, the drivers, everybody should have a, uh, a part in uh, 
taking care of the principal and other team members medically. All right, uh, once again, we're gonna med map all the personnel. Uh, so we wanna know their medical history, medications, allergies, and prior medical history. And we wanna know what's going on so we can have on hand something that can help them or mitigate any, uh, any sickness or illness. Uh, blood type, once again, uh, pretty obvious. If they lose blood, we wanna put their, put their blood type back in, if at all possible. IFAX, now obviously everybody on the security team should have an IFAC on their person. Uh, we'll show you some, uh, this is an IFAC picture that I, uh, it's kind of broken up, so it's not just one kit, but this is the stuff that I was wearing on a detail in Juarez, Mexico. I believe it was uh, last year or the year before, somebody asked me what kind of medical gear I was uh, using uh, or carrying on my person. So I actually just broke it out in the hotel, laid it on a counter and took a picture. This is the stuff that's just on me. Uh, so you may think this is overkill, but when you're, you're going into areas where it's uh, medium or higher risk, uh, you're gonna want your trauma gear and you're gonna want it on you. Uh, way back in the day when I started in this industry, uh, there was like a big med kit in the car and that was about it. Nobody even carried anything on them or very rarely did they carry anything on them. And uh, that was uh, a, a big mistake. So now uh, what I do is I kind of front load trauma gear on my person. Those are two ankle rigs down there. And uh, we've got the upper left is a blood stopper bundle. I can throw that in my jacket pocket and I'll usually make a couple for uh, drivers and uh, even the principal. Uh, if there's somebody, usually if it's somebody we've worked more than once, uh, we can explain uh, a little bit about what we're doing and have them carry some gear for us. Uh, and again, that's because I want to use it on them, not because I want them to treat anybody. Uh, and then the upper right, you see there's a trauma, some Leatherman trauma shears. Um, these are the Raptors, really nice. They, uh, they actually fold down. You can actually fold them down and shove them into one of the uh, ankle kit pockets if you want. Um, they have a uh, seat belt cutter, a ring cutter, um, it has a window breaker, a vehicle window breaker on it. A really handy piece of gear um, to have on you. Um, anyways, uh, we'll see if we can throw this into a PDF and with some other information and share it with you guys on our, uh, on our uh, platform, our community platform. Uh, oh, and as you see, uh, pretty much everything I had there was dealing with trauma. Okay, we had the tourniquets, we had gauze, we had wraps. Um, uh, we had something to take care of a... A critically serious problem. Um, I'm not going to strap along around my ankles, uh, you know, Advil and uh, uh, band-aids and things like that. I'm not going to take real up real estate on my person if it's not for an emergency. If it's on me, it's got to be for uh, a, a pretty severe emergency. All right, uh, let's move up to a pack. Uh, when you're out on detail, you'll always have a pack with you. There's a couple different types of packs, so I'll go over that really quick. Um, I always want mine to be low pro and I'll, I'll tell you about the couple different types of packs I see people wearing and I'll, I'll tell you why I, I use the one I do. Uh, the sling packs, uh, you'll see a lot of these in Mexico, particularly these are the Maxpeditions. Uh, it's a nice piece of kit, but it just screams your bodyguard uh, or executive protection. And a lot of times I want to be able to jump out of a vehicle and maybe not have everybody know exactly who I am or what I'm doing. Um, sometimes you can't hide it, right? Uh, when we say low profile, low profile is not undercover. A lot of people confuse that. Even people in the industry confuse that. Low profile just means you're not shoving it down somebody's throat, what you're doing. Um, so I prefer not going this route because uh, it, it just kind of, especially in Mexico, and again, there's other areas, but this just screams that you're, you're doing something um, security related or law enforcement related or something like that. Uh, so they have the, uh, the EP admin bags, too, out there. They kind of look like this, another sling bag. Again, kind of looks like uh, if you're the only guy jumping out of the car with a sling bag, pretty much everybody knows what you're doing, especially if you have all kinds of carabin carabiners and stuff hanging off, your, hanging off your bag. Again, if I have to, I just like to be able to get out of the car, go into a store or hang out uh, around my clients and not be immediately pegged as the bodyguard. Sometimes you can't avoid it. But if I can avoid it, I will definitely try. So uh, I usually go for uh, just a more conventional backpack, pretty typical, I can get out of the car. This one actually is kind of Gucci, I just found this one online. Um, I'll see if I can, uh, in that PDF I'm gonna make for you guys, I'll see if I can uh, just take a picture of the one that I'm carrying now. Um, but what I like about this also is since 1993, what I do is uh, I've taken uh, soft uh, ballistic vests uh, an actual complete vest, and I've shoved it inside of my uh, my pack. 
what that does is it gives me two layers of the soft vest and then everything in between. So it's a pretty good ballistic package. Uh, and if you can see the, uh, the complete coverage I have on my back with a full backpack as opposed to maybe an admin bag, um, you'll get a lot more uh, a lot more coverage. Unfortunately, executive protection is one of the few pers uh, tactical professions where you may have to grab a client and go the other way. Uh, you know, most tactical classes, you'll, you'll be taught never to turn your back on a threat, but unfortunately, that's part of our job is to grab and go sometimes. And hopefully there's somebody else there to take care of the threat while we're getting out of dodge. Now, if that's the case, then uh, something like this, especially lined with uh, some sort of ballistic material, uh, is really handy. And again, also, I have to consider that this might be my only baggage for who knows how long. And I want to be able to have enough space where I can put everything I need in there. And it still has to be small enough, though, to fit into the seat of a plane. All right. Uh, again, this picture I just got online. I actually uh, have a tool backpack that I use for myself. And uh, again, I'll, I'll see if I can throw that in the PDF. I don't have it in this presentation. Um, look at how this thing is constructed. Look at all these pockets. I can just see tourniquets kind of lined up in here and all kinds of other gear. Look at these pouches. So these things are made for tools. What I like about that is they're a lot less expensive than uh, something that's designed spe specifically for medical or executive protection. Um, so they're a lot cheaper and they're a lot tougher. Uh, they're made for tools, they're made for weight. So there's a lot of reinforcement that goes into the straps and into the materials. Um, so I really like those and the backpack style also, you can slide a, a, uh, a laptop down in there also. Like I said, I don't want to carry this plus one of the sling bags because now I am just have a bunch of extra bags that I don't need when if I just use one backpack, I can slide my uh, laptop in there. I've got my, I can throw my ballistic panels in there front and back and have all my stuff that I need in the, in the midsection there. That's just another shot I got online, another tool backpack. This one has a light built in and everything, which could be handy depending. Um, but you can kind of see the benefits of a uh, backpack like this. This is a compartment bag. Now this one is made for cameras. I actually use a compartment bag right now. Mine is made for tools or electronics, but it has these movable compartments. I like this because I can actually, half the bag I have uh, medical gear and another half of the bag I actually have my own admin stuff. I have a tightly rolled rain jacket. I have all my chargers and all the stuff that I might need uh, if, uh, if this is the only bag I have left and I'm separated from all my other stuff, then at least I can uh, make things happen with that bag. Um, we'll show you kind of what goes into this bag now. So first, obviously, you're going to have more trauma, uh, trauma gear. So you've got your trauma stuff on your ankles and maybe in a pocket. Now think mass casualty. So now maybe you have your, uh, your principal, maybe they have seven or eight uh, people with them, which is not unusual all the time, if, especially if you're working an artist. We work a lot of uh, artists that work outside the states. If they're even if they're American artists, and when their management team feels they're going someplace that is risky, that's usually when we get the call. So we we'll work artists, uh, we're working artists all the time in Mexico, in Colombia, in Brazil. We work them in Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, um, pretty much uh, anywhere where management teams feel that there's a risk, we'll go ahead and work them. When you're working in artists, they'll quite often have photographers, videographers, uh, tour managers, and uh, could be a, a whole string of other folks with them. So we want to make sure that we have enough trauma gear. So the stuff on our ankles, yeah, that's that's pretty good. But now let's beef that up a little bit and put some more in there. Now, in addition to that, I'm going to put some what we would consider in the States EMT uh, gear in there. Uh, and we'll talk about training, too, uh, at the end of this. Uh, probably a stethoscope, blood pressure cuff. I'll have a blood sugar tester in there. I'll have splint material. Um, let me see. There's, here's some stuff that I would probably uh, have in my pack. Um, so you can see the, uh, this is the electronic blood pressure. You might want the uh, conventional ones as well. Stethoscope. These are really handy. These are compactable back valve masks. Uh, we use these in training and we also use these in the field. Uh, there's a pull socks right there. You'll want one of those. Uh, some sort of warming. The space, space blankets I'm not really sold on. They're okay um, if you can only keep it on your person. But if you have a pack, um, a blanket is a pretty easy thing to, uh, an upgraded blanket for warmth for your casualty is a, a nice thing to have. And you can get better ones than just slide them down next to your laptop or whatever because it does, does take some space. 
Uh, the SAM splints, uh, if you guys are in the medical field at all, you know that you can do a hundred different things with those SAM splints, not just uh, splint the arm as shown here. And so those are really handy to have. Well, all these things I can fit into half of my uh, pack and the other half, like I said, is reserved for myself and my uh, admin stuff. Ah, and uh, last but not least, a first aid kit. Now, for those of you who don't know uh, that terminology that we used earlier, IFAC, Individual First Aid Kit, um, we kind of refer to the, when we say IFAC, we usually mean trauma. When we say just first aid kit, um, that's our what we call our boo-boo kit. That's uh, Band-Aids, uh, aspirin, uh, well, not aspirin, not because we work in high threat areas, but uh, and other analgesics, uh, painkillers. Um, you have your... Uh, you can see a bunch of stuff in here. You have your ointment pads, you have your uh, iodine wipes, you have your band-aids, you have tape, you have all the stuff that you might need for minor injuries. Um, you're going to want that. I'll, I'll usually get one at a uh, outdoor store or a camping store. Um, the couple that I have, those, those all came from uh, camping stores. And then I'll break them down and kind of modify them to what I need. And so that's that will go into one of the... Uh, uh, the pockets in my pack, uh, then I'm pretty much set. You're going to use this one more than you're going to use your trauma gear. I mean, hopefully, <laughs> um, but this one you'll you'll actually have to have to break out now and again. Uh, last but not least in my pack is any sort of medication. Um, this was medication we'll pick up. Uh, I picked this up on the ground uh, before we went into a conflict zone last year. And basically what I was doing is building combat pill packs. Again, combat pill packs, that's a, a term you'll learn in other our actual medical classes. We, we will put our medical classes, our theory stuff online as well. Um, but uh, you can get almost everything you need um, on the ground in a lot of these places that you're going to be traveling if you're an international traveler. It's a lot easier to get them there than it is to here, and it's a lot cheaper as well. And so you just have to uh, know how to kind of translate over what you uh, what you need and what it's called over there because it will usually be called something different um, but that will usually go in my pack as well all right platform so let's talk about the platform your fourth p here and that's going to be your uh, transportation platform uh, suv van pickup truck uh, a helo depending on what you're uh, what you're rolling in uh, we'll try to put extra medical gear in there depending on what we can get our hands on in the situation this was a uh, platform we used in Saudi Arabia after the first day of trying to travel around there and the ridiculous traffic where we were. Uh, after that, we uh, contracted with a helicopter company and anywhere we went from the hotel, um, well, we only had one, ven one main venue we would go to. We would uh, take this helo transport. So that became our platform. Uh, most of the time, uh, you guys are going to be rolling in SUVs or vans, depending on where you're you know, traveling to. Um, what do I want in the platform? Uh, well, uh, again, if it's a dangerous area, I always consider uh, high threat areas because that's mainly what our firm works is high threat areas. And so I just want more, um, more gear. Uh, an EMT kit, if you don't know what an EMT kit is, uh, if you're not from the States and don't use that term, that's an me emergency medical technician. Uh, that's uh, somebody, that's a baseline uh, qualification for someone that works on an ambulance. And above that, you'll have... Uh, a couple other quals, you'll have advanced EMT, and then you'll have the paramedic. Um, and uh, But the EMT kit, depending on the, uh, the skill level and the licensing of your uh, highest uh, medically rated team member, um, you're going to see if you can fill it full of uh, gear that's going to benefit them that is not maybe uh, going to fit in your packs. Um, we'll show you a, an example of that in a minute. Yeah, so there's a... EMT kit right there, so you can kind of get the idea. So it's something that might be uh, reserved for ambulance use. But if I can throw that in the back of the car, great. Um, you can see some of this stuff here we talked about earlier. I would actually transfer this uh, blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, back valve. I'd, I'd put that in my pack as we talked about earlier. Um, but this uh, EMT kit, you're going to have a lot of other stuff. But you're going to have to customize it to your uh, yourself. Um, there's an EMT kit we had a couple months ago in Syria. This was in the back of our vehicle. This right here um, shown that vest in the middle with the red cross, that is actually my rig. So the stuff that I had in my ankles, I actually had ankle kits, but I also had uh, medical gear there. You can see a tourniquet right there next to the flashlight. Next to that tourniquet, you'll see uh, some comms gear. 
Um, this was our rifle rated vest and we had level four hamlets. We went in with a production company, but you can see that ENT kit down on the, uh, on the left side there. Oxygen, um, be careful carrying oxygen, especially if you're, if you're rolling around, uh, you know, areas where small arms, small arms fire might be a problem. Um, if you're carrying uh, oxygen and tank, um, that could obviously become a problem if uh, the skin of the tank is pierced with a round. Uh, foldable litters are great. I've actually, uh, in the last, last year, I used and took one of these and used it. Um, these only cost about 30 bucks. I believe this one was from North American Rescue. Again, I just got this picture offline. I think that's where I got the one that I actually brought. I just can't remember. Um, but they're really, really handy. You can fold them up and throw them in a, uh, a suitcase. Um, now, when I travel for less than three days, um, I will, generally speaking, just have a backpack with me and uh, a roller bag, and that's about it. Uh, if I'm going on a long trip overseas, uh, what I'll usually do is bring a lot of medical gear with me because what I do is I try to do some before and after my, my details. I try to do some training with local units, uh, and then I like to leave the medical gear with them. Uh, generally, I'm going to places that they need it, and so I always take a couple suitcases packed full of uh, med gear. And so uh, when you're doing that, this is real easy because you can fold up these, these litters uh, and throw them in there. It's not really practical to carry around the framed litters. Um, they have some good ones out there that are foldable as well, but they're not really practical to carry around. But these are, uh, these are not bad, and when you need it, it's really handy. Advanced gear, this is really going to depend on where you're going, what you need, and it, can somebody actually use it. There's no sense having a bunch of gear uh, that nobody can use. So if you're working with uh, special operations medics uh, that have the, uh, the training to do like transfusions or something like that in the field, then yeah, it's not a bad idea if you're going to one of these conflict zones uh, with some journalists or production crew or whatever. Uh, to be able to do this because you just you just never know and again this is only if you have the the right personnel um, this is something that i would consider obviously advanced um, there's no there's nothing restricted here in this uh, in this kit which is what i like about it um, but with obviously the know-how it could be a lifesaver depending on where you go and again this is way advanced and it's this requires somebody that knows what they're doing and it would require a an environment that it would be needed so it's not just something you're gonna to take to a, uh, a detail in San Francisco, that would be kind of ridiculous. And lastly, we have place. So let's go ahead and briefly talk about this. If you have somebody who's sick and or injured, you should have a place to take them. Uh, quite often when we're doing our uh, advance work and we're putting together route maps before we go, we're gonna be mapping out as many uh, medical centers, hospitals, uh, trauma stations, everything we can find online will do. And then when we get on the ground, we'll go ahead and kind of shore that up because you're not always going to find a lot of good. Um, if you're going to a foreign country, you're not always going to find uh, good information online. But when you hit the ground and you meet up with maybe your local team or whatever, that's when you guys will spend your advanced time and you'll map all these uh, medical assets. Uh, now, it really depends on where you're going. If you're just in a regular metro area, you're just going to be mapping uh, hospitals and you're going to know what, uh, what type of trauma they can handle, so what trauma level. And uh, you're going to kind of uh, prioritize that and you'll, map, you'll put that on your hard maps as well as your electronic maps in your phone so that no matter what, you can get somebody to medical attention. Uh, if you're working in conf conflict zones, then they might have uh, trauma, trauma stabilization um, centers set up somewhere, um, usually about five kilometers behind front lines. Uh, they'll have places where they're bringing individuals that were hurt on the front and they're taking care of uh, life-threatening trauma there before they actually move them back to uh, hospitals. And so if you're traveling with, uh, like I said before, journalists or documentary film crews or whatever, and you're going into uh, dangerous areas, um, you can go ahead and map those out. You'll definitely not find those online. So those, those are what you're going to find on your advance and hitting the ground before your client gets there. And then you're going to map them again electronically and uh, hard map. And uh, we already talked about hospitals, Red Cross stations. Uh, some countries will have Red Cross stations set up, so you're going to want to uh, map those things out also. But you're going to need some place to go. And uh, finally, you're not, you need to consider, depending on what type of area you're in, again, I know I talk about uh, hostile environments a lot because that's where we work. 
Um, so you know we'll give it we'll give it to you in a in the worst case scenario, kind of a hostile environment, not a lot of good transportation in or out, um, not a whole lot of medical care available, and now you guys can bring that down depending on where you're working. Um, so if you're working, you know, in Los Angeles, yeah, you probably don't need to go way overboard like we do. But when we're working in these different areas, we might be it for a while. So if you're talking about remote or extended care, uh, you might have to have some more gear in that EMT kit to actually uh, take care of um, not only treating the wound initially, but now keeping it clean and monitoring their status. Um, now you're talking about um, uh, basically a nursing function. So you're going to be cleaning wounds and you might be monitoring urine output and there's different pieces of gear you, you're going to probably need for something like that. Again, this is, uh, unless you're working, you know, in a, in a war zone, it's probably not going to come into play. But even if it doesn't come into play, think about evac. So you might have mapped out hospitals wherever you are. You've, uh, one of the crew members or one of the, uh, the principals or one of their entourage has become sick or injured and you transport them to that hospital, well, now what? Uh, you're probably not just going to leave them there. You may want to transport them back. Maybe this is down in Mexico, back up to the States. Uh, maybe you're in a place like Syria and maybe you want to transport them to a neighboring country that has higher medical care or higher level medical care. Uh, so you're going to want that evac plan to kind of go uh, go hand in hand with your, your place. So we've got them there. Great. It's better than what they had out in the out in the roads, but now what? Uh, what's our next step? Uh, that's about it. Let's recap this. Um, there's our five P's again. Our client, know what's wrong with them. Uh, make sure you have uh, what you need to take care of them. Uh, should something go wrong? Personnel, same thing. Uh, know what conditions everybody has, what needs that they, ha what they have as far as medications and allergies and whatnot. Uh, make sure they have the training um, to use the gear that's available. Um, pack, same thing. Your personnel should each have a pack. Everybody should break out their packs before you do the details so everybody can see who has what. Platforms, if you have the means to do so, obviously that EMT kit or similar in the back of that, uh, that car, that helicopter, whatever you guys are using for your transportation platform. And place, uh, make sure you have medical assets mapped out around your venues, around the hotel, around the airports, along the routes, uh, and, and if appropriate in neighboring countries and have that evac plan to get them out. All right, I talked to you uh, about the five Ps. Now let's just go into training really quick. Um, just some considerations here, guys. Again, this isn't the end all be all. It's just uh, some, some thoughts if you're gonna be working protective details. Uh, you're gonna need to know how to detect and what to do about uh, medical emergencies. You're going to get a, medic a medical emergency uh, before you're going to get some sort of penetrating trauma. So uh, you're going to want to learn about uh, cardiac problems, uh, stroke, dehydration, blood sugar issues, uh, allergic reactions, food poisoning, the difference between the two. Some people uh, confuse those two. Uh, and then obviously we don't want to ignore the, uh, the trauma scenarios, but you're, you're, like I said, you're probably going to have to deal with a medical emergency before you'll have to deal with any sort of penetrating trauma. Uh, some training options out there if you're in the States, uh, the EMR cert, that's a week-long cert, uh, would be your uh, your starting point. Uh, it's kind of like EMT light. Uh, emergency medical technician is that baseline ambulance worker. Uh, and then the uh, UK and much of the rest of the world uses the FPOS, first person on scene qualification. There's a bunch of different levels to that. So you're going to have to look at the different levels and Obviously, you're going to um, get whatever training you can, where you, what your budget allows or your client's budget allows and your, your time that you can sacrifice to your medical training. But it's hugely important, so I would, I would definitely recommend getting to the highest level you can and then uh, keep going with it. Uh, BLS, so that's quite often basic life support. That's the CPR, AAD. Um, that's part of most of these programs that we've listed above. Uh, TECC, that's Tactical Emergency Casualty Care, and T. CCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Well, TECC is uh, more of a civilianized version of the TCCC, which is more of a military version. That's uh, the penetrating trauma. Uh, all that stuff on your ankles um, is really uh, what you're going to be uh, addressing um, with that training. Um, that's the, uh, the penetrating trauma. Um, protection specific. So after you have all that training, you should do a lot of different drills. 
um, regarding your protection work just to make sure that um, not only are you uh, getting into the evacuation phase soon, but you're treating along the way and prioritizing correctly. Uh, it's a little bit different when you're talking about protective duties and uh, administering medical, medical care than a lot of other professions. Uh, so if you're doing properly constructed drills, then you can kind of get used to uh, prioritizing these things. And just make sure your training is regular. So if you're on a regular team, uh, great. Uh, you guys can do drills. Um, every drill that you do, um, what we would do in our seven-week academy is we would try to do the, the medical portion early on. That way, when we went on and did the other uh, parts of the uh, protection training, uh, quite most specifically the uh, immediate action training where there was uh, an emergency going on or an attack or something, we could always integrate in the medical training that we've already done. Uh, so not only if you've done your medical training, now you're bringing it into the other training as well. We'd bring it into the firearms training. We would bring it into the immediate action training. Um, so you're, you're kind of getting it over and over again. And when the students got out of the course, they were pretty fluent at, at medical, and that's what we were looking for. So just make sure however you do it, uh, you get as much training as you can get, and then you continue with your team or just going to courses and uh, you know studying it online. Uh, if, if nothing else. Uh, you'll learn a lot from what other people are doing because um, the, especially when you're talking about TECC and TCCC, um, those things change a lot. Every, every few months you're going to see another guideline or something that's changed because they've realized in the field something didn't work or something worked better. Uh, all right, guys, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Oh, there we go. Um, so there's the, uh, if you're not on this site already looking at this, uh, this video, then uh, whatever platform where you're watching this on, head on over to courses.sec4360.com. We have our free online community there. Uh, if you're uh, on YouTube or Instagram or something, um, please make sure you sign up with us. Comment, uh, like, uh, helps with our algorithm. Uh, anyways, uh, any questions, go ahead and uh, contact us. Uh, the best place to reach us is over at courses.sec4360.com.